lady did. Catherine Ronala, remember? Did she give you something free? Anyway, I'm just playing. Please don't be offended. I'm funny guy. Okay. <laughs> Pat, help me, Pat. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> the Mystery of the Shemitah, updated edition. All right. Hey, that one's for you, buddy. All right. El Libro de los Misterios, Hispanic. Toma. The Book of Mysteries. I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I said don't get mad. Okay, Grace. We, Jesus loves you. Wow, that was, that was intense. <laughs> that was really intense. Um, so we're in for a treat this afternoon. Um, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn is um, a personal friend, and uh, I've gotten to know his, know his family. I've been to his house. I've, you know, there's some people, okay, when you meet them, you're like, yeah, but how do they really live? Yeah, but what's... What are they like, like behind the scenes when the lights are down and the mics are off and the cameras are off? Then what are they like, you know? And I can tell you that seeing it from all angles, knowing him personally, being to his house, seeing how he operates, this is a pure, pure individual who really just honors God through his life, through his ministry, through his daily actions, through every decision that he makes through every word that he speaks. So make no mistake that what the word we receive today, uh, he has poured over this with prayer, and um, he's very calculated. He, he's so in tune with the Holy Spirit and the voice of God. And so uh, I just want to honor you, Rabbi Jonathan, for everything that you've done, for who you are, for the partnership with our company, and uh, it's just an honor to publish you. Um, and for many of you who don't know, I'm going to just take another couple minutes here. The Lord brought Jonathan actually to us through a supernatural occurrence. Um, there was a prophetic word that was given. So he had a flight delay. This other guy had a flight delay. That other guy um, operates on the prophetic, happened to be in the same airport, and says, well, I'm late. What do you want me to say, Lord? Who do you want me to talk to? And so he points to him to this Jewish-looking man. And this Jewish-looking man is praying that the Lord would lead him about which way he needed to go, about this next decision he needed to make. So prophetic man sits next to Jewish-looking man and says, I don't really want to talk to him because he's not going to receive what I have to say because he's Jewish. But you, you won't let this go, Lord, so here it goes. So how's it going? Jewish man looks at him and goes, oh, no, I'm sorry. He says, so what's the good word? Jewish man looks at him and says, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Prophetic man says, well, I didn't expect that. Well, he didn't really say that. That's kind of what he's thinking. And then they kind of strike up a relationship. And then he's, uh, prophetic man proceeds to tell Jewish man, you're about to go in a certain direction. The Lord's leading you this way. And he's, you know, you got to go that way. And I'm giving you a paraphrase, a very Reader's Digest version here, but... So you got to go that way. So then he says, uh, I have a friend. Prophetic man says to Jewish man, I have a friend. His name is Steve Strang. And I'll introduce you to him. My friends, that is the very fast version of how the harbinger landed at Charisma House. Isn't that awesome? Come on up. Let's uh, give a warm welcome to Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Shalom. Well, Marcos, I was going to open up with that story, and you just blew, just ruined it. I have nothing to share now. No. I was going to, do you want to hear the kind of, the behind the scene of that story? Okay. I'm going to share a lot, but this is the first conference that I've ever done with Charisma that I remember. For those who, uh, you've heard it, Charisma is the one that publishes my books, and they have to be open in the spirit. They were open because I had never written a book about, and they didn't know me at all, but they, they were just open. Steve Strang was open in the spirit to say, this is of God. That's how it happened. That, it's a spirit-led uh, ministry. And so I, I thank God for charisma. Um, the Lord has blessed, and it's great that we're here together, uh, that everyone's being blessed. I, by the way, the worship was wonderful. The presence of God is wonderful, and you love the Lord. You're hungry, so the Lord honors that. 
Um, so before I share, what I'm going to share is probably very different from what has been shared. I'm going to give a real very prophetic message. Afterwards, I will, uh, I'll meet you. I'll, be, I'll sign off. They'll have me wherever that you're doing the thing, and I'll be signing your books. I'll be here as long as I can be here until I have to go back. Uh, by the way, greetings from the promised land, New Jersey, <laughs> to the other promised land, Florida. <laughs> That's the Jewish thing there. Uh, but I'm going to give a message that is, you know, linked to, for those who don't know, the paradigm and where we are right now, the signs of the time. This is the other part because we are called to be prophetic, have a prophetic witness for this time, and we need to know the signs of the times in which we live. So let me, before that, because of, the, of where we are, and sometimes I share it anyway, so let me just give you, a, from my viewpoint, what happened, how this all connected with charisma, and how the harbinger went forth. I wrote a book. The Lord led me to write it. Never wrote a book in my life. I don't know how to write books, but it just came as a download. It was the harbinger. And the week that I finished it, I was heading on a, a plane to go to Promise Keepers in Texas to speak there, and the plane stopped at Charlotte Airport. And there I just gave it to the Lord. I said, Lord, because people were saying, you gotta, you got to brand yourself, you got to do this. I'm not branding anything. I said, Lord, th I, I bowed my head at the airport, and I said, the prayer was, Lord, the harbinger is your message. It's from you. You did it, not man. And therefore, you know how to get words out. You don't need agents. You don't need anybody. Just by your hand, you do it. That was my prayer. I opened my eyes, and then and there's a man sitting to my left. Now, let me just give a little bit, little bit here background. How many people are into football? Okay, okay. When you're Jewish, you're not, not so much into football because, it, because it's a... A lot of very big Gentiles running after an unkosher pigskin. It's very scary. <laughs> very scary. We just kind of avoid it. We know that Moses wrote something against it, but we can't find it. <laughs> but for you who know football, the mo one of the most famous plays in football history, the Super Bowl history, was the catch that called the helmet catch by David Tyree. David Tyree is a born-again believer, and he was praying, Lord, more than football, I want to spread the gospel. And so God, so he went into the game. Before he went to the game, a man gave him a, a prophecy saying, God is going to lift you out of obscurity and you're going to glorify his name. So when he went into that game, he was there saying, is this it? He knew it was going to be a catch from the Lord. And he said, is this it, Lord? Is that it? And then it happened. It was an amazing catch and it changed his life. Suddenly he was known all over the world and he wrote a book and it was published by Charisma and he mentioned the guy's name who gave him that prophetic word. Okay, cut back to the airport. I look up, I pray that prayer, I look up, the man is sitting to my left, he turns to me and he says, so what's the good word? And I said, what's the good word? I said, and I said, God loves you. And he said, I know that, but what's the good word? And I'm thinking, this is real weird. So I start witnessing to him, I'm trying to get him saved and he's trying to get me saved. We're both trying to get each other saved. <laughs> until we realize we're both saved. And the thing is, for those who know the harbinger, it, it opens up, or the opening, the encounter is there's a man in a public place sitting down at a, on, a, on a public chair, and to his left is a man who's called the prophet who turns to him and starts making small talk, conversation, and then all of a sudden he starts giving him a prophetic word. Well, that's exactly what happened. The Lord was recreating what I just wrote in the book. So now I'm sitting here, he's to my left, and he makes the, the conversation, and then all of a sudden he says, Jonathan, you've written a book. The book is of God, and the Lord will himself will spread it across America and the world. He'll do it by his hand. He goes on and on. He goes, his hand. Now, the thing was, now this, the guy who's giving me the word is the same guy who gave the prophecy to David Tyree of the Super Bowl. And he wasn't supposed to be on that flight. He's supposed to be on another flight, but his flight get, kept getting canceled by the rain until they put him on my flight. And he just sat down when I was praying. And as, as, you know, Marcos told you, I'm praying, and he said, he, Lord is saying, speak, and he's saying, I'm not going to speak, Lord, because for some strange reason, it's weird, but he won't, he won't, but he thought I looked Jewish. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wearing black, and I kind of went like this a little bit, so he thought, he thought, oh, he's orthodox, you know. <laughs> so literally, he was gripped with pain until he opened his mouth and gave me that word. And because 
of David Tyree because of the Super Bowl catch. God works everything together. Because of that catch, because he mentioned the guy's name who was now sitting at the airport who put that guy named Hubie in touch with Steve Strang. It was all a setup from God. A little while later, we get a contact from Steve Strang saying, I heard what happened at the airport, heard about this thing called the Harbinger. We have no idea what it is, but we're interested. That is how the Harbinger went forward to the world, not by man, but by the hand of God. And that's where it all began. Now the Bible says that the sons of Issachar, they knew the times. You must know the times in which you live. That you might fulfill the calling that God has for you. And we are living in critical times. The ground is shifting. We are witnessing the most Massive cultural, moral, spiritual, ethical transformation of a civilization in world history. And people are saying, what's happening? Looks like everything has been out of control. But imagine if they discovered a master blueprint that, that lay behind everything, uncovered everything that's happening right now. From over two and a half thousand years ago from the Bible, but revealing the events of our times. Not only what has happened not only what has happened, what is to happen, but when. Pinpoints in cases the exact year, in some cases the exact month, in some cases the exact date. Imagine if it revealed not just that, but the people of our times. The leaders, their actions, their personalities, what they would do, and how long they would have on the stage until they had to go. What if it revealed that behind each of the leaders in our times, there was an ancient prototype leader from the Bible that they are following that determines what they do without them even knowing it? What if the blueprint from the Bible actually could tell us the outcome of elections before they happen? What if we were all replaying it? An ancient mystery replaying in our time, telling us not only where we are, where we've been, where we are going, but also who's in control. What if we could open up this blueprint? That blueprint is the paradigm. This is where we are now because this is the call for where we are now. And if we had known it, if I had known it, which I didn't, years before, you could have marked your calendar, future events, pivotal events, years before they took place, down to the exact day. And does it contain a warning for the future? And does it contain a key for us now what to do as the people of God? The paradigm contains a very prophetic revealing very much like the harbinger i didn't plan on writing it like the harbinger just kind of came as a download but it intersects with the harbinger for those who don't know the harbinger in a very quick nutshell well before i even say anything let me give a, a warning or a caution or a i don't know or a disclaimer it is so explosive that i have to say this i will name names but we must remember we have no enemies only the enemy we must oppose what is evil. We must pray for those who commit it. Anything else is sin. Number two, I'm not going to give you political correctness. I'm going to give you truth. So we gotta, so take out all political preconceptions. It's only about God. Now I can only touch on some parts of the mystery. But for those who don't know the harbinger, it is the revealing of nine signs that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel, a nation that had fallen away from God, warning them of judgment, and those same nine signs have appeared in America, warning us now of what will come if we don't turn back. Both the paradigm and the harbinger reveal a nation, an ancient nation that once knew God, Israel, a nation that turned away from God, drove God out of its public squares, called what was evil good and what was good evil. It promoted sexual immorality, embraced idols, false gods, chief among them the god called Baal or Baal. Baal was the god of increase, gain. He promised them fertility for their fields and prosperity in every part of their life. But he required something of them to worship Baal. There was a price to it. His worship had priests and priestesses engaged in sexual acts. Sex was taken out of marriage and put on the public stage of culture. Marriage was degraded in the wake of a sexual revolution. Sexual immorality, it became, the popular culture became sexualized. Some of his priests were called the Kadashim. They were male prostitutes, men as women. So now it involved the confusion of gender. 
And Baal had his altars, required the price. They were to offer up their children as sacrifices in his fires. So they'd approach the brazen idol, place their child in the metal arms of that idol, release the child into the flames. The scriptures record they made their children pass through fire, and so God would judge them. That was the metamorphosis that undertook ancient Israel that once knew God. So America and Western civilization was also founded on the word of God. But our civilization has likewise been undergoing a metamorphosis. We have been turning away from the God of our foundation. We have likewise been driving God out of our public square, calling what is evil good and calling what is good evil, promoting immorality, embracing our own idols. We would never call it by that. But America also follows the spirit of Baal, the God of increase, gain, prosperity, success. And as with Israel, there comes a sexual revolution. Sexuality is taken out of marriage, put on the popular stage of culture. The culture becomes sexualized, driving God out and bringing in idols. Sexual immorality, it, it proliferates and sexual confusion. And also, as Israel offered up thousands of its children on the altars of Baal, we have offered up millions of children on the altars of abortion. But in the fall of ancient Israel, there comes a period where the apostasy accelerates. Pagan morality actually now becomes the ruling morality. It is endorsed from high places, from the palace. The nation experienced now a culture war. In America, we also experience that. There's been an acceleration. Began about 25 years ago. It was called the culture war. For the first time, anti-biblical values were passionately championed from the highest places of our culture. In the paradigm, there is a man, a king, called Ahav, or we know him as Ahab. He's divided, he's compromised, he knows of God, but he wars against the ways of God, becomes the first king in Israel to champion the worship of Baal. That means child sacrifice. That means sexual immorality. That means the overturning of biblical values. So too in America. We had a culture war begin, and the term was coined with the rise of a man. It's not about the man. He doesn't know what he's doing, but nevertheless, as a sign, the man rises to power. His name was Bill Clinton. He will follow the paradigm of Ahab. The mystery of him will be Ahab. Not that he knows it, but he will be a man divided, knows about the Bible, brought up, brought up in the Bible belt, yet he'll end up endorsing ways that go against the Bible. Ahab was the first king to champion child sacrifice, so Bill Clinton was the first president, leader of America, to champion abortion, the killing of children. And as Ahab sought to redefine the values of Israel, so Bill Clinton would actually make a statement saying, we are redefining the immutable values that have guided us thus far. In a chapter of the book called The Days of the King, the question's asked, how long was Bill Clinton on the national stage? When did his rise to power begin? Bill Clinton rose to power, came on the national stage in 1979. He was elected governor of Arkansas. It would last until the beginning of 2001, the end of his presidency. How many years? 22 years of Bill Clinton. In 1 Kings, it's written, Ahab, son of Omri, reigned in Samaria for a period of 22 years. Ahab wasn't alone, neither was Bill Clinton. In the chapter of the paradigm called The Queen, a new figure enters the stage. Her name is Isabel. We know her as Jezebel. Grows up in a cosmopolitan culture, liberal values, Phoenicia. Daughter of the priest of the goddess Ashtoreth, so she worships female power. She will marry Ahab, move to his land, but she'll never adopt the values of that land. She will instead see conservative religious values as something that's an obstacle to be overturned. And she will incite her husband, well, Hillary Clinton will follow the paradigm of the ancient queen, not that she knows it, not that she intends it, but she will. According to the paradigm, she grows up in a cosmopolitan culture, Chicago, venerates female power, marries Bill Clinton, moves to the Bible Belt, never adopts traditional values. She sees them as an obstacle, something that is to be overturned. She will actually pronounce these words. She will say, deep-seated religious beliefs have to be changed. She will war against them. And as so it was with the king and queen in ancient times, so Bill and Hillary Clinton will be forming a co-regency, a co-presidency. 
Jezebel in Israel would be the chief advocate of Baal worship in Israel. That's child sacrifice. Hillary Clinton would become the chief champion of abortion in America. She was actually voted by Planned Parenthood the abortion champion of the century. Together they would advocate against these values. Not that they knew what they were doing, but they did. Of the two, it was Ahab, the one who wavered back and forth. He was emotional back and forth, so Bill Clinton. Jezebel was more of a hard, kind of a, a harder personality. So, so, so the same way. The paradigm reveals secrets in high places. What Jezebel did, it's written that she brought the priests of the Phoenician gods and goddesses into the palace. The worship of these goddesses. And in that ancient time, in that worship, that involved speaking to the dead. It involved familiar spirits. And so... In the same way, it seemed impossible that anything like this could ever happen in America. But what would happen, actually, the first...